Idi Amin had announced that we will be deported. And also he mentioned the 10 million pound aid which the British government had promised him and they were not giving, giving that money to him. And this was again this, a revenge attack, but then he mentioned all these, you know, sabotaging the economy um, and milking the economy, not integrating all those, you know, <laughs> points he mentioned. Uh, so the, the next problem was, you know, how do we reach, how do we get the visa to, because the British had imposed visa system on us, rather than saying, okay, uh, you are British, so you just come over and you know, we'll look after you. No, you have to go through the visa system. So there was long queues outside the British High Commission. No, we had to wait outside the British High Commission you know, to get the visa to come here. And we had to queue. And what the Amin's men used to do was to, uh, because we had to queue maybe for the whole day or the, sometimes even overnight, so we would have a lunch box whatever with us or pay, some other Indians would come and help us, you know, bring us. So they would steal this from us, you know. They, they would not even, the Amin's men would not even allow us to to eat outside while you're waiting the, to get a visa. Uh, the other problem was the number of flights, you know, there, there weren't that enough flights to bring us all here. So who's going to organize that? So, and, and obviously British High Commission was, the, 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 the High Commission was active. But there's a problem in this country because I don't think in, initially Mr. Heath's government was, was happy to allow us in for, you know, for his political reasons. Uh, and if you look at the cabinet papers, the 30, well, in those 1972s, you'll, you'll find that uh, Edward Heath was talking in the cabinet to send us either to Falkland Islands or to Fiji Islands or to Solomon Islands. He didn't want any one of us to come here. <laughs> Obviously, he was trying to salvage himself from the, from the uh, political um, comeback if he allows uh, 30, 30, 30 40,000 people to come into the country suddenly and the impact it will have uh, on, on, on the social services and education system and all the other aspects. So he, he wasn't very happy with that either. Maybe he knew inside that these are refugees and they are British passport holders. They, they have to come here. They can't go anywhere else. No other country will. India would not accept. They, Indira Gandhi said very clearly that we don't want. These are British subjects, so let them go to England. This is Mrs. Indira Gandhi, yes, yeah. You can see how shocked we were and how nervous we were. Uh, and it's very difficult to describe those feelings, especially those 90 days uh, we had to go through. Because somebody asked Edie, I mean, that why have you given these people 90 days to leave? And he says, look, these Indians have the habit of giving 90 days credit. So let's, <laughs> let's give them 90 days to leave. As you can imagine the state of the Indians there, very few about 80,000 in the country, about 30,000 holding British passports. And the journalists coming in to, you know, from various countries coming to interview Idi Amin. And somebody, were, I still remember somebody was asking Idi Amin, so look, uh, if they don't leave, what will you do with these Indians? Oh, he said, I'll, I, I'll teach them a lesson, he says. He says, yeah, so what will you do? And then this journalist was telling, would you set up camps? I said, yes, yes, I'll set up camps for, for them. Uh, and then somebody said, would you set up camps in line with what Hitler did, you know, in concentration? He said, yeah, I'll do that as well. So, you know, he was moving into that direction. All those fears, you can see what the Indian community was going through. Uh, the waiting at the British High Commission. And what, you know, and, and this is really embarrassing as well, that, you know, it comes 10 o'clock, they would shut the High Commission office for the tea break. Comes, and they knew there were hundreds of people waiting outside and some of them have slept overnight. Some of them coming from villages like mine, Masindi, and Lira, and all the other towns. And then comes one o'clock, it's closed again for the lunch break, and they would come back at what, about two, half past two, and while we were just waiting outside to get our visas to come here. The other problem was, you know, so even we say, okay, fine, we'll wind everything up and go. And we were the last ones to leave because my father didn't want to leave Uganda because he said, look, I don't want to, I've been here for 40, 40, 45 years, and this is my home. I don't want to leave Uganda. So he wasn't prepared even mentally, so you can see what he must have gone through. Um, so the other problem which we had to, was the roadblocks. You know, we, we had to go through all the roadblocks, which Amin's man has set up, and, 
uh, these soldiers, you know, about 18, 19 years old soldiers, they used to harass us. Uh, they used to steal whatever you had. Sometimes, you know, they would, uh, some of the women would wear anything in their ears, so they would just take it out, you know, without even asking them to remove, you know, so you can see what the torture was going on. And quite a few of pe people suffered uh, through the roadblock because they were looted again <laughs> by Idi Amin soldiers. But there was not only one roadblock, there were so many. I would say 20, 30 before we reached uh, Entebbe. There were so many horror stories from so many different people. Some, you know, they were showing guns uh, on their neck, you know, and, and uh, some of the older women and all the children were thrown out of their vehicle and then they were looted and everything good was taken away from them. So those horror stories uh, will remain. Uh, but the other thing we, if we talk about Idi Amin was that, uh, okay, he was able to deport us. And there were about four or five Asians who were killed. But if you take stock of the Africans who were killed during Idi Amin's time, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, probably the figures mentioned around 300,000 to five, about half a million who were killed or slaughtered by uh, Idi Amin.